Good. Now we will be starting to focus on page 63. And we'll see that indeed. What we will be trying to do is to have a progressive approach into the heart of Florensky's intellectual project, starting from his own manifestations. And, let's say, this progressive approach begins with a dialogue with culture. Okay, Florensky will set a dialogue with culture, but he will actually do it on the basis of an anthropology of holiness. Right, and this is fundamental. To Florensky, a true dialogue with culture can only be done on the basis of an anthropology of holiness. And this way, then, this, let's say, this urge of communion has as its fundamental root holiness that unites and reunites all men, regardless of their cultural and historical conditions and so forth. And the first thing Florensky will do in this dialogue is to define philosophy's main task. It says so on page 64 in the quote. And I think it's starting from the third. No, it's three lines before it ends. It says, Father Pavel wrote, Philosophy is great and valuable, not in itself, but as a finger pointing to Christ and to life in Christ. And so what we see is that indeed, to Florensky, philosophy is a means, not an end. And it's a finger that has to point us to the right path leading to truth and a living truth, thus Christ. And therefore, in pointing us the path to Christ, it should also lead us to life in Christ. Or to put it in St. Bernard's terms, philosophy only works as a useful doctrine of salvation and not really as means or as an end in and of itself that would satisfy the curiosity of intellectual novelty while precisely leaving unattended the truth that's at stake. And so sometimes in philosophy there's a clear temptation of leaving truth aside and focusing only on the intellectual novelty. And so what we see is that, in short, to Florensky, philosophy is, in this sense, something propedeutic, right? This propedeutic would precisely be like the initial step into accessing holiness itself. It says on page 65, and this would be more or less five or six lines into the text. Florensky says, geology, which contains in itself geography and ascetic, right? This subject that had never been taught in the academy, and he's talking about Moscow's academy, on this view, according to Father Pavel's thought, has to be consecrated to the study of the saint's personalities, soul of ecclesiastic life, bearers of ecclesiastic conscience, mature fruit of the life in the church. And so what we see is that philosophy, indeed, must be in the service of this mature fruit of the life in the church. Thus, ultimately, it must be in the service of the profound and adequate study of the personality of the saints. Knowledge of the saints, of the structure of their personalities, of the laws of their lives, of the peculiar features of their experience and their mentality, of the relationship between these laws, this experience, this mentality, and the typical and sinful humanity, doesn't it represent the knowledge of the fruit, of that comprehension of life, whose teaching is the effort that the Academy has called for? And so here we see how, indeed, to Florensky, the only fundamental motive of study, which is to say of academic study, is holiness. Thus, the acquisition of holiness. And here we could draw a parallel with Saint Benedict, whom we already mentioned once, the ora et labora. And so, the study, ultimately, as the principal means to access this life's purpose, that would be precisely holiness. That's why the next paragraph says, The ultimate sense, thus, of Florensky's intellectual work, of that vital task, that rooted in his childhood experiences, constituted the line of his intense work, was the study of the conditions and structures of holiness. And so, the future worldview 
whose ways Father Pavel wants to prepare is none other than the worldview from the fullness of Christian life in the Holy Spirit. And so, first, we see how, on Florensky's view, the conditions, let's put it like this, and structures of holiness appear. And therefore, from these conditions and structures of holiness, to precisely take on this holiness as the fullness of Christian life in the Holy Spirit. And we can say that this is precisely one of Pavel Florensky's fundamental aspects. To analyze the conditions and structures of holiness, the latter understood as the fullness of Christian life in the Holy Spirit. That's why, to Florensky in this sense, it's so important that we start addressing little by little both the conditions and also the structures themselves of holiness. Thus, to understand their dynamic, right, this dynamic of holiness that constitutes the fullness of Christian life in the Holy Spirit. And hence, we can see now that to Florensky, theology is worldview. And thus, theology is precisely the profound study of this fullness of life. In short, theology to Florensky is none other than the study of holiness according to its conditions and structures. And in such a way that thus, as we see on page 66, second paragraph, second line, the text says, Florensky's intellectual work aimed to be the translation of a Christian message into a new language, taking into account his time's questions. And so the fundamental intention that was moving him was to set a dialogue between faith and the profane culture, or in Bulgakov's words, his friend, right, Sergei Bulgakov, to unite Athens and Jerusalem, and in a deeper sense, faith and life. And so, what we see is that this fullness of Christian life entails the precise knowledge of a dynamic. And this dynamic is none other than the fundamental dynamic that happens between faith and life. Between God and man. And precisely how does this fullness of life, this Christian dynamic in the Holy Spirit, entail the fundamental relationship between faith and life, between God and man? That's why on page 67, at the beginning of, of the page, it says, The construction, study, and development of a religious worldview is seen by our author as the only means to revitalize the Christian life and to bring dogma closer to the modern man's conscience. And so, this dynamic between faith and life results in a religious worldview. And therefore, it is this worldview, to Florensky, the only possible way to bring holiness closer to the modern man. And why? Because the modern man, indeed, seems to be deprived of at least this possibility. Right? And this due to the very structures that modern life has been progressively taking on, which we could summarize in a very simple way, in three... in three particular manifestations. First, materialistic positivism, which denies the entry to any spiritual manifestation. Two, the development of the alleged autonomy. Thus, all the ways in which human self-governing itself is conceived, and therefore, the interference of any power external to human reality is forbidden. And third, we can say, the current confusion that predominates in human life regarding the search for meaning, 
And thus, the possibility that man has nowadays of trying to find alternative sources to give meaning to his life outside of God. And so, we could say that it's about three aspects or structures that are fully immersed in the modern life and that would be first in this sense as we mentioned it would first be this possibility of autonomy second materialism in let's say all its possible manifestations right or expressions and finally we could say the secularity because secularity has, as Charles Taylor already showed us, basically three dimensions. The first, which would be the most usual, is the blunt separation of church and state, right? The second form of secularity would be the absence of religious forms in the public space. For example, as when starting a class at a public school, I'm not allowed to begin this by saying a prayer, or that the precedent of a certain country where it's a cross or a religiously distinctive sign. But, says Taylor, it's not only there that secularization lies, it also lies first and foremost in the state of faith. And this state of faith is today characterized mainly by the immense plurality of options in which we find ourselves. And so secularity thus also affects our lives as believers and even as non-believers. Or to put it in a much more summarized fashion. In this sense, and this is another obstacle to overcome in the modern life, and it's what Florensky looks for in the integral worldview, that today we assume Christian faith and the Christian life as just another option among others, and not as the definite one, right? And this takes us then to always assume a kind of internal uncertainty. Thus, to question ourselves if this way, through which, from a Christian perspective, I relate to transcendence or the meaning of life, is the only possible way to take on. In short, it would seem as though today there's a great offer of alternative possibilities precisely to live this faith. Right? So what Florensky wants is to set a dialogue with our modernity, right? A modernity that even we today are still part of. And therefore, as the text still says right there, it's about this culture divided in the end of this positivistic worldview and the beginning of a new age, still undefined, but that can be integrated into the ecclesiastic worldview in such a way that thus, this religious worldview, this integral worldview, is qualified as follows. And we see this in the following points down below. Against a fossilized dogmatism as a living worldview. What does a living worldview mean? Florensky himself tells us, it's necessary to think of orthodox dogmatic as a worldview that's truly alive and religious. What does he mean by this? By, by this dogmatism or this living worldview? That we realize again that dogma is not reduced to a mere formal expression, thus to a mere theoretical expression that supposedly wouldn't have any kind of impact or relevance in our Christian life. And therefore, we would be called instead to recognize that dogma actually shares with us a truly alive and religious worldview. Hence, not to suppose that dogma would stay, so to say, fruitlessly installed in the discursive dimension, but that dogma indeed has an impact on our own human life. That would precisely be the first. Second, against the atheistic view of life as the religious worldview or the Catholic ecclesiastic worldview, which is to say universal. How does Pavel Florensky explain this? By saying this on page 68, the absolute conception of the world is Catholic Christianity. And here, as I was telling you, the important thing is that we take back and recover this force of the living truth, and that we do not give in to the temptation of the current relativism, 
Remember, to Florensky, this age that was just beginning, which corresponded to the beginning of the 20th century, wasn't, um, yet defined. But now we do know the fundamental features of this emerging culture, and they are three. Relativism, in the first place. The second, pluralism. And third, secularization. And these would be the features that Florensky was intuiting that take us to recognize then the absolute conception of the world in Catholic Christianity. So not to give in to relativistic pressures in the contemporary world, and in short, to recognize that in this Catholic Christianity lies the truth, and therefore, life. It's there precisely that the very source of truth lies, and therefore we could say the source of holiness. Overcoming these current temptations that could lead us into some kind of confusion. To suppose that our Catholic Christian stance is not ultimately foundational, or that it doesn't stand out among the many religious options that are being offered nowadays in the modern world. That's why, if we go back now to, um, to page 67, in note 64, Florensky says something important. He says, in particular, it's very convenient for the atheistic stance, the faith's lack of intellectual development of the ways of considering men and nature that are implicitly contained in the faith in Christ. Or to put it differently, what actually suits atheism enormously is precisely the absence of Catholic life, and therefore the absence of a serious approach with regards to what life in Christ means. We could say then, our omission this is one of the aspects that suits atheism enormously. And in this sense, there's not only an omission, a lack of interest, but there is also a guilty silence. And that's why Florensky says now, a worldview that is silent about these fundamental problems cannot help but raise mistrust in everybody who, for better or worse, but in any case with sincerity, dedicate all their attention and strength precisely to these questions. And so, according to what seems to be the case today, the fundamental questions that are demanded or that are present in our current world are not precisely addressed by Catholics. As if the Catholic had absolutely nothing to say. Or in other words, as if Christ were impotent to answer today's questions or to say as if Christ were some kind of generalized impotence that no longer has, let's say, the relevance to give answers that we are indeed looking for in light of the truth. All right? He says right there following this, but actually, it is utterly evident that Christianity has something to say. Something to say on this matter just as much as it's also evident that it's quite clear what the obligations are for all Christians regarding all creatures. That's why we said that nowadays the Catholic needs to take on his own obligations. And his own obligations are two. First, to come into a real communion with Christ. Why? To help others go through the difficulties of the current moment. In other words, the fundamental obligations of the current Catholic are to receive Christ for the good of others, to really put oneself in the service of others. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why if we go back now to page 68, what we see is that the third point against the thought of reduced elites, right, these exclusive intellectuals, as the worldview of the universally human culture. So, Florensky says, In the Christian worldview, the universally human comprehension of the world is crystallized. What does it mean? That thus, this religious worldview is indeed also capable of comprehending 
the universally human aspect, hence the human. And therefore, the Christian, if it is the case that he is in the source of truth, will have a lot to say to other men. In short, our Christian life is for the benefit of everybody else. And therefore, we're called to delve into contemporary reality in Christ's light. Hence, we're ultimately called to have truth triumph over this net of lies and hypocrisies that dominate the contemporary world. Everyone will do it in his own field, but one thing is a fact. Without study and profound dedication, this cannot be accomplished. And therefore, we are called in this sense to acquire what Pavel Florensky told us yesterday. First, great intellectual quality. And second, spiritual height. And so, we're called to really present ourselves as what we really are. Fullness of Christian life in the Holy Spirit. That is to say, witnesses of this holiness, witnesses in this sense of the living God. He says in the next point, against the abstract, um, against philosophical abstraction, as the philosophy of concrete idealism. What does Florensky say? That philosophy is thus idealism, but not the ideal, not an idealism concerning thoughts, but concerning concrete contemplation and the vital experience of spiritual beings, thus worship. And this is how this direction of thought that I would like to defend is defined, concrete idealism. And so, we're also called to take on reality just the way it presents itself, with all its shades, with all its complexities, and with all the challenges that it indeed posits, for example, both in our reason and our own stance in the world, right? So to preserve, in this sense, our own true life integrity. The other point, against the culture of illusionism in all fields, as the proper view of realism, that's why I told you that one of the aspects that we can no longer hold by any means is this false illusionism. Thus, to go against reality itself. Not to face reality with all the challenges and problems that it indeed throws at us, in general as men and in particular as Christians. And that's why Florensky says from the third and final line in this quote, Illusionism is opposed by realism. Illusionism's urge is to make up. Realism's is to discover. To discover what's eternal in being. And so, we're not called to make anything up. We're called to discover the truth in its current reality. Or in other words, we're called to discover the truth in its contemporary manifestation. And what is ultimately the primary thing that's discovered through this realism or through the authentic, spiritual or religious worldview that encompasses also the universal aspect of what's human, the eternal in being. And here we even have an itinerary posited by Edith Stein in her work Finite and Eternal Being. To Edith Stein, the fundamental thing was not to establish some kind of factual ontology or an existential ontology, but rather to take on mm -hmm, the path of a doctrine of being, thus to access the eternal in being, to the eternal being, as Pavel Florensky calls it in this sense. That's why in the second line of the next paragraph he says, thus, Florensky says, if I have labeled your superficial worldview as naturalistic in the sense of the well-known literary school, a literary school that is indeed represented first and foremost by Zola, this French naturalistic writer, that's basically a naturalism of surface, thus an ultra-detailed scientific description of things just as they appear, we could say, based only on the material phenomenon, right? And its way of representation. He says now, we have to label ours, and quite rightly so, as symbolic, because in it, the knowledge of the world appears at the same time as a contact with the other worlds. And so, the fact of the overcoming of naturalistic illusionism, 
and of the superficiality that was even showing in this literary school. And that, curiously enough, a Catholic convert called Maxens van der Mersch will be reformulating. Maxens van der Mersch will start as a faithful disciple of Zola's, but he will then be little by little separating himself from his master, because he will see that naturalism, in Zola's sense of his literary school, is insufficient to comprehend reality itself, in such a way that then, in Maxens van der Mersch's work, which is very hard to find, his publications are not easily available, maybe it could be possible to find something in some very old bookstores, but he, for example, in a text called Bodies and Souls, he starts to show that the description of nature can only make sense if it shows or uncovers for us the supernatural reality. And this would also be the symbolic path that Florensky mentions, or the case of another French writer called Villiers de l'Isle d'Ame. Villiers de l'Isle d'Ame is also an extraordinary writer who was we could say, or whose fundamental purposes in literature, especially in some short stories that he has, he has a book called Sardonic Tales and some other stories, or Eve, um, Tomorrow's Eve, um, he wants us to not lose sight of the contact with the other worlds. In other words, mere naturalism that keeps only the natural has the symbolic way to recover the supernatural, without nullifying the natural, but from this unitary vision, and thus integral. And so the attempt is to achieve a single ensemble, and this single ensemble is precisely the symbol. And in this sense, as Florensky says on page 69, in the quote, and starting from the third line, we should also give life to a thought that's capable of thinking of unity and also of antinomy. And so even the most extreme, infinite and finite, God and man. And so an intellectual potentiality that doesn't run away from antinomies, that's not frightened by these, let's say, um, intellectual contradictions, that reason cannot ultimately dominate, but to ultimately take on in this sense a Catholic thought, a truly unified thought. And in this sense, what we see is that also, to Florensky, all of this flows ultimately from the Trinitary dogma. Why? Because Trinitary dogma to Florensky is precisely this total or fully symbolic unity that helps us achieve the proper model. And this is more thoroughly explained in the text on page 70, from the second paragraph. It says, indeed, the Florenskian worldview is, first and foremost, a Trinitarian synthesis, thus a worldview born out of a full philosophical development of the dogma of divine unisubstantiality. In this sense, the integral worldview is qualified by Florensky in terms that gather all the philosophical value of the ancient Aryan controversies as a homoousian philosophy, opposed to the contrary trend of thought, the homoousian trend that's characteristic of rationalism. And so, to Florensky, let's say, the ultimate perspective of this religious worldview is homoousian. Let's see here how this is put. Meaning real and concrete. Because the Arians wouldn't accept that the Son was consubstantial to the Father, thus identical to the Father, that is to say, true God and also true man. What does this mean? that the Arians couldn't stand the symbolic manifestation of the word in this case of Jesus. And for that reason, they were attributing here versus the homoeusian. Thus, similar. 
almost the same. So just similar. Because the Aryans will develop this homo Eusian perspective, precisely suggesting that Christ was not really nor concretely either God or man, that he was either God, some will follow this tendency, and therefore he was not a man, or vice versa. He was a man, but then not really God. He was similar. He was almost like a man, but he wasn't really a man, or the opposite. He appeared to be. He was almost like God, very similar to God, but he wasn't God himself. And so, finally, Florensky will choose throughout his whole work, the homoousian perspective, which is to say real and concrete, which is to say symbolic. Without being trapped in the homoousian perspective, that is to say the heretical perspective. Mm -hmm. And so to Florensky, it's clear that it's necessary that our thought take on all the challenges presented by the symbolic character of reality itself. This difficulty that we sometimes have to reconcile that which we find contradictory. Or, to put it simply, what is difficult to assimilate. That's why to Florensky it's fundamental that a school of believing reason emerge. And he says so in the last line of this page. To Florensky it's fundamental that a school of believing reason emerge, thus a symbolic reason that won't settle dissociations, that doesn't start from divisions, and that doesn't try either to hide itself behind what could be thought of as non-integral approximations. The homo Eusian, this that is very close, very near, almost identical, but it's not the same. Because this would ultimately break the very unity of the Trinity. Alright? So, moving forward in this school, of believing reason, Florensky says in note 75 of this page, the Christian philosophy, thus, the philosophy of idea and reason, the philosophy of the person and of the creative ascetic work, can be defined as the homoousian philosophy, and hence, it's a philosophy of the spirit. And this is what Florensky is ultimately looking for, that this religious worldview, homoousian, real, concrete, and symbolic, will not make the homoousian mistake, okay? Of the similar, the almost the same, of the approximations, of proximity without communion, of that which will come close to a certain extent, but that ultimately constitutes a profound absence of will of communion. And so this religious homoousian worldview is precisely what would make way for authentic philosophy. And so philosophy would be, in this sense, the school of believing reason. All right. That's why, if we go to page 73, from the second paragraph, the text says, On the other hand, as a Trinitary ontology, the school of Eastern theology offers the basis from which Christology is made comprehensible and inserted in a precise hierarchy of truths. And so, what's fundamental is that we too preserve a certain order, a fundamental order of comprehension and therefore also a fundamental order mm -hmm. of experience in such a way that then if philosophy is in this sense and respecting this fundamental order the school of believing reason it means that thus philosophy in this sense would also be a path for holiness it would be deeply linked to holiness it would be let's say a very useful and very fruitful tool to assimilate this dynamic between faith and life that ultimately uncovers for us the conditions and structures of holiness. And therefore, philosophy would be this very fruitful tool to be gradually acquiring the fullness of Christian life in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
It really calls my attention today, by the way, that when we, for example, want to make reference to a saint that was a philosopher in general, the ones that we have at our disposal are saints that were also indeed theologians, thus they were religious. But it's interesting, perhaps, that it's very difficult to find a saint that was merely a philosopher, without having been in this sense ordained or consecrated. Now, in this hierarchy then, once Florensky has already given philosophy its due place, from there thus, and by the way, this is similar in the case of St. Justin Martyr, who was a Greek philosopher with great knowledge of the ancients. By the time of his conversion, he said, now I am a philosopher. Why? Because philosophy was understood as a preparation for holiness. Right? Philosophy was the means through which men are being prepared for holiness. It's preparation and assimilation, so it's theory and practice, hence contemplation. Remember that contemplation is theory and practice in unity. And so philosophy is being presented as contemplation. Thus, theory and practice in unity. And therefore, we could say, contemplation, philosophy as contemplation, theory and practice in unity, have their foundation in the spiritual realm. And these are situations that even today, since the modern age, are being increasingly separated and divided more and more. And that's why he will say at the beginning of... Yeah, on page 74 from the third line. Another factor that motivates and configures Florensky's form of thought and his working methods is the following. The theological and spiritual tradition of the Christian East. And so we see that in this sense, if the role of philosophy is clear, also in this dynamic, now also here, we can find the fundamental role of tradition tradition, ultimately, as a living reality that gives us living material, right? Witnesses, thus saints, from which then we can also extract enormous richness and particularly coming from the Christian East. It says now down below, we believe that it's necessary to interpret all the Florensky and theological itinerary in light of the categories of knowledge and the Christian spirituality of the East, if we want to avoid hasty conclusions and have a solid ground in order to understand such a universal, omni-encompassing, and even colossal theological attempt. So, what we see here is that to Florensky, philosophy and tradition in this sense go hand in hand the intellectual and the practical, theory and practice, come together precisely in this homoousian religious worldview that takes on concrete reality in its symbolic dimension without looking to set dissociations, divisions or separations, but primarily trying to preserve the unity, right? Not to lose unity. Even if this entails an enormous growth of reason, and also even a bigger growth of the spirit itself. And so that's why to Florensky, it's important that we start going through this rhythm, right? This rhythm of learning as a vital aspect to be undertaken. It's a vital task. So, in the tradition, we have not only antecedents, but we can also find the basis of our vital task. And our vital task, in this sense, from tradition, is first, recovery. Second, enrichment. <laughs> 
And third, contribution, or in other words, transmission. So, from tradition, the first thing that we see is that we have to carry out a profound effort of recovery to go back to this tradition that precedes us, so that we can be enriched by its contributions, and thus we can, at the same time, transmit that which is our duty to give. Right? So in this sense, to retake the best, so that we can offer something that's even better, and also to remain precisely in this dynamic or path of life. That's why to Florensky, theodicy and anthropodicy go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. The intellectual and experiential constitute one and the same dynamic unity. That's why on page 75, at the beginning of Florensky's quote, Pavel Florensky himself says, Before man's justification, we have to find God's justification. Before the anthropodicy, we have to find the theodicy. What is Florensky telling us here? Let's keep the hierarchy of truths. And within this hierarchy of truths, God comes first. Then man. First it's he. Then it's you. First comes God. He says anthropodicy and theodicy. Here we have the two moments that make up religion. Because at the foundation of religion, we have the idea of salvation the idea of the divinization of every human being. The first of these moments is par excellence, the sacrament, the mystery, that is to say, the real descent of God onto man, the divine self-humiliation, thus his kenosis. But, in order to address this divine self-humiliation, which is salvific in purifying, hence cathartic, the self-humiliation that justifies man before God's face, Humanity must carry out the second moment that we have mentioned, thus the justification of God. And so therefore, in this dynamic, what we see is that first comes God, then man, and finally taking this divine initiative to its fulfillment. In fact, we could say in advance that this is a saint. The saint is nothing more than the culmination of a divine initiative. The first one to take the initiative to carry out this extraordinary work is God. Man has received it, but it's God who fulfills it. So, to be then, in this sense, faithful to Christ's own reality, right as when he mentioned in the Apocalypse, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And so first go to God, then to man, and take this divine initiative, this preeminence of God, to its fulfillment. Okay? That's why it says right there, this aspect of religion is essentially revealed as a doctrine, a dogma, and it's therefore configured as humanity's contemplative elevation towards God, humanity's exaltation or divinization, thus the theosis, but only contemplative. Now, we will delve into this final moment, the moment of God's inevitability, the dogma that sets God's right to generate man's justification. And so, following this, what we can actually see is that indeed, as we have been mentioning, the first thing that we can notice here is um, God's justification. And so, God's justification means, in this sense, to take him into consideration as what comes first, then, in this sense, man's exaltation would come in. And so to move on now to the anthropological and finally to contemplate it in its living unity and whose figure, whose concrete reality, whose perfect living symbol is precisely Jesus of Nazareth, right? True God and true man. Here's where the fundamental lines of this homoousian philosophy would go. And so, what we see in this sense is, as it says in the second line, um, it's fundamental that we first appeal to God so that then we can authentically access man and so to finally understand the relationship between the two. Why? Because depending on this fundamental integration between God and man, we will be able to observe the emergence of holiness 
precisely in the world. That's why this takes us to understand that the starting point of all philosophy is the Incarnation. Because the absolute concretion of the mystery lies precisely on the Incarnation. Thus, the very Incarnation of the symbol. We see this on page 76. In the last paragraph, it says, If anthropodicy is the gift of grace in the mysteries, theodicy is the process of comprehension of the revelation of the mystery. And that's why it's configured as the elevation and divinization of man in his contemplative dimension. It is the properly theological moment, the development of theology in the sense of Eastern mystical theology. And so, what would theodicy be in this sense? As it says right there on page 77, the contemplative personal adoption in the spirit's experience of dogmatic reality. Or to put it in simple terms, theodicy is precisely the spiritual experience that philosophy helps us actually gain access to. And finally, as we see at the beginning of the next paragraph, anthropodicy and theodicy thus correspond to the totality of the mystery of salvation. Even though each, each one of them, even though each face, anthropodicy and theodicy, is centered around one of the aspects of this mystery, the sacrament and dogma, respectively. And so what we see is that, indeed, as I said, Philosophy is shown here precisely as a useful doctrine for salvation, especially considering that its starting point is the Incarnation. That's why what we see now is that salvation is shown as a balance of high potential. And what does it mean? That in taking into account precisely the mystery of salvation in its two fundamental dimensions that are joined together is anthropodicy and theodicy, Florensky will wonder about the following. It's in the third line of the last paragraph. Florensky says, In what sense can the examined book may be considered precisely as the Odyssey? To clarify this question, it's necessary to bring in some very elementary considerations about the nature of religion. Religion is, or ultimately claims to be, fulfiller of salvation. Its objective is to save. So, to Florensky, religion. Can only be properly understood in terms of salvation and not as an existentially preferential stance. Right, is that which I rather take on as yet another compliment in my life. But instead, precisely to Florensky, religion has to do with salvation in a precise way. Religion's only objective is to save, as Florensky insists on, an experience in the spirit. Okay? This salvation is an experience in the spirit. That's why what we see is that, therefore, mm -hmm, it says on page 78, second line, that theology will have the task of expressing and defending the truth of a saving relationship. And so it is here where, indeed, we see now the main purpose of theology. Theology has the task of expressing and defending the truth of a saving relationship. And so what we see is that theology is not in the service of man's intellectual potentiality, thus of his own rational capacity. But instead, theology also can only make sense in virtue of this salvation, which is the fundamental purpose of religion. Now, what Florensky wonders now is, what do we need to be saved from? What is it really that we need to be saved from? And he says so at the beginning of the quote. Religion saves us from ourselves. So what we see is that the first fundamental step in religion is that it saves us from ourselves. It is the authentic path of salvation. Why? 
Because, as Florensky says, religion saves our internal world from the chaos that it itself spreads. And so what we see is that in this experience, in the spirit, that indeed constitutes the only real purpose of religion, means then to free us from chaos. From our own chaos. Precisely the shadows that constantly wrap our human life. That's why it says now, religion defeats the Gehenna, which is in us, and whose tongues, making their way through the fissures of the soul, come to lick the conscience. And so this Gehenna, which is precisely the abyss, the abysmal, the chaotic, the shadows, we could say the filth that sin has left within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this filth, that through the fissures of the soul, the human weaknesses, can even lick the conscience, trying precisely to devour it, to finally sink it in a hellish state of downfall, right? I wouldn't like to go further so much because we will see this much later on, but this is so that you can understand where this is heading. And that's why Florensky insists that she, religion, causes the reptiles of that big and ample sea of subconscious life to flee, and its number is uncountable. And so, what we see is that religion, ultimately, will save us from ourselves. That is to say, it will save us, in this sense, from these inaccessible subconscious depths that only, through religion, can be effectively brought to light and therefore defeat and suppress. Why? Because it hurts the snake that nests there. And what is the snake that nests there? Precisely, sin, mm -hmm. that is present in every one of us. He says, she reconciles the soul and sets it in order. And so what we see is that religion is an order. It orders all of our being in view of salvation, right? It orders, ultimately, hurting the snake that lives on the inside of every one of us. He says, but by restoring the soul's peace, the entire society is also pacified, and so does all nature, right? And here it's worth making a marginal comment. Why does Florensky affirm that the soul's peace also pacifies the entire society? For the simple reason that one soul that has been finally ordered by religion, that is to say that has been again reinserted in salvation and thus has acquired peace, no longer hurts the others. Mm -hmm. It no longer hurts others. It's no longer a source of hurt or damage for the others around him. On the contrary, it's also going to be an instrument of salvation for everyone around it. And so, that's why we should also take the following into account. It's fundamental that in our prayer, we ask in a constant and continuous way for the most evil ones. Because when they are converted, many will benefit from this. There's no longer this urge for destruction, this eagerness of downfall that indeed deconstructs and especially destroys human relationships. That's why Florensky says right there, this way, if the external world is not abandoned by religion, its genuine place is, however, the soul. And so, what's fundamental is that this order is an order in the soul. And therefore, it's a spiritual order. Because sometimes, we would like to get from religion a merely external order, and thus, we would somehow like to have it work as a successful institution and, in this sense, also competent. But that is not the fundamental purpose to which religion is heading. Religion has a deep impact on the soul of every believer and not precisely on the visible structures that we, um, also share while being in the world. That's why at the beginning of the next paragraph, in the fourth line, the text says, Here we would like to highlight how Florensky, coherently with this indication of the soul as the genuine place of religion, 
In the study of theological themes, we'll always start from the experience of personal life, from the psychological data interpreted in the dynamic of spiritual attention, from the divine image to the resemblance. So this order in the soul, which is therefore a spiritual order, constitutes a step, a definite step, and a crucial one. This definite and crucial step is the step from the image to the likeness. Because this image, even though sin created havoc, has not disappeared. It is an image that indeed preserves us precisely in this unassailable integrity. But the step from image mm -hmm, to likeness requires an ordering and therefore religion's intervention. We could say the image in this sense is what we are. And that is creatures, right? God's children, but we still haven't become what we should be. And so it's the step from what we are to what we're called to be. Mm -hmm. It would be this dynamic of growth or experience in the spirit which is the step from image to likeness, thus from what we are to what we're called to be. And this would entail precisely, first, to get rid of that chaos that we have that certainly pressures us or subjugates us, blocking us from the fundamental liberation of the living truth. And from there it is that Florensky will distinguish two aspects of religion. I'm in the next paragraph. The first one is ontological. Florensky says, Ontologically, religion is our life in God, and God's life in us. This feature concerning the deepest core of the theology of grace is the most radical one. And so, we could say, what happens really or religiously in us? What are the deepest occurrences that are precisely experienced in the soul? Right? In this dimension, which is precisely the one addressed by religion. And these occurrences, or we should say, this experience in the spirit, require a proper deepening. Because to Florensky, it is clear then that the fundamental intervention of grace, of this vivifying grace, goes to our most intimate and secret aspects, there that only God can reach. And so we could say that the fundamental step from image to likeness, from what we are to what we're called to be, remains in the very secret, where God and man collaborate, thus in the soul's intimacy, in the fundamental secret of a human heart. Or, in other words, this crucial step, or religion's fundamental work, is carried out in the invisible field. And therefore, this is a truly spiritual field. And it is precisely there where the principle of life in communion with God lies. And so, we see that this order in the soul is the beginning of a life in communion with God. And this beginning of life in communion with God is indeed carried out as the fundamental purpose of salvation that religion offers us. Thus, the true experience in the Spirit is therefore the beginning of a life in communion with God, carried out in the most secret aspect of the human soul. This intimacy that only God has access to, and therefore ultimately take charge of this radical transformation. And so, what we see here is that the beginning of a life in communion with God, which is precisely the fundamental experience that religion offers us, is precisely conversion. And with all this, we could say that conversion is 
the clearest emergence of God in the human soul, and therefore the fundamental principle from which this experience in the spirit begins, which is none other than the experience of salvation. And so the first is ontological, right? It takes us to the depths of being. This beginning of a life in communion with God is carried out in the depths of being. Or even better, in the depths of what we are. Thus the image. But there's also another dimension. The first one that we mentioned, right? The first one of these aspects of religion is ontological. But the second one is phenomenological. Thus, experiential. I missed here. Close the brackets. It's phenomenological. Now on page 79, in the second line, Florensky says, Phenomenologically, religion is the system of actions and experiences that procure the soul's salvation. So, its religious aspect of worship, actions, in the ample sense of sacramental organism as a whole and as a personal experience of salvation. And so, this beginning of a life in communion with God directs us afterwards to worship our cult. Thus, to what we're called to be, in this case, the likeness. And we can say that here, the actions that emerge from salvation get underway. And these actions that emerge from the cult are precisely going to be taken on as a personal experience of salvation. And so, a social experience of salvation that indeed links us to worship will be seen the social experience of salvation as effectively corresponding to religious experiences. These would be the religious experiences that ultimately take on, in this sense, one and the same soul. That's why, to Florensky, there's also a psychological dimension. We've seen now the ontological, the phenomenological, but there is also a psychological dimension in religion. What is it that religion offers us then in psychological terms? It is the balance of inner life. And so, what we see also is that by being freed from our internal chaos, we also acquire a balance of inner life. Or, to put it differently, we're given psychological health. And so, what we see in this sense is that, to Florensky, in psychological um, terms, salvation is precisely the balance of anemic life. And so, the psychological health is a balanced soul. And one of the aspects that Florensky insists on in order for balance to give religion an unconditional character, it shouldn't be any kind of balance but actually a perfect balance and of the highest potential corresponding to human nature. That is to say, not ultimately incoherent regarding our own reality, offering us situations that just don't correspond or else promising aspects that are actually alien to our own reality. And from this is that Florensky on page 80 says, we read, a balance without contradictions, 
which is the balance of death, wouldn't correspond to the longings and the dignity of human life, to its capacity of openness, to the accomplished infinite. And here we have it. This balanced soul acquires a capacity of openness. To the accomplished infinite. And so, here, we can also see two fundamental aspects. First, not any religion is capable of giving this balance to the soul or this capacity of openness to the accomplished infinite. Why? Because this capacity of openness to the accomplished infinite means that religion indeed carries through its true duty, so it fulfills its purpose, which is a life in communion with God. The fundamental thing is not about the way in which men try to organize this principle, but where is this true and living God who does fulfill what He promises? who does deliver what he offers. And therefore, this religion is in the church and in the Christian church, in this Catholic church, which is one. That's why we can read more or less three lines below that the text says, Florensky considers the Christian faith as that religion before which all the others can hardly be called religions. Take a look at this. Carrying out this ontological, phenomenological, and psychological analysis, Florensky actually realizes that outside the Christian faith, the other options could hardly even manage to be called religions. That is to say, the Christian faith, which is maximally antinomic and thus presents the highest possible synthesis, corresponds to the search of man's proper balance and turns into the one religion capable of reconciling in one living synthesis the most extreme contradictions of the human path. So it is indeed in the church where the Christian faith lies. And that is why, after thoroughly carrying out this accurate analysis, Florensky concludes that ultimately, outside the Christian faith, out of this living church, whose religion actually consists in taking this definite and crucial step as a living experience from image to likeness, and therefore acquiring the principle of life in communion with God that is carried out in the depths of what we are, in the most intimate part of our being, and that by doing so we're integrated into a worship whose actions also express a social experience of salvation as religious experiences, is the only one that really saves. We could say, if the only purpose of all religions is to save, then not all religions actually save. Only the Christian religion saves. It is there that salvation is to be found. Or to put it differently, the only one that can really hold the title of religion is the Christian religion, and not because of its efficiency or human arrangement. It's because there is the living and true God, the only God, that indeed carries out extraordinary works. Works so extraordinary that we have very clear examples of this magnificent capacity that God has to transform man, the saints. Okay? And so let's ask the Lord that He give us this deep experience of the Christian faith. And if it's okay with you, we'll leave it here and see you next time. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.